Hello and welcome to the first programme of the Cash Show series. Over the next four days, we'll be taking a look at the main management principles when it comes to calf rearing this spring. Today, we're going to be discussing the preparation of the farm before calves arrive, and also the factors the farmers need to consider when it comes to purchasing calves this spring. Our panellists are Dorian Carden from Munster Bovine, Sean Cummins from Chagask, and Peter O'Hanoran, who is a Green Acres Calf Beef Program participant. To start off with, Dorian Carden is going to give us a quick run through of the factors to consider when it comes to calf housing this spring. When it comes to dairy calf to beef systems, getting the environment right is very important. Dr. Doreen Corridon from Munster Cattle Breeding Group outlined some of the important features of calf sheds on Chagas Green Acres calf to beef participant Peter O'Hanron's farm in County Kilkenny. We're on a super shed here today in Peter O'Hanron's farm and what he basically has is a four bay shed. The shed is 50 foot wide, two uh, pens of uh, 20 foot wide each and uh, a 10 foot passageway. Uh, how Peter maximised ventilation with the fresh air is he has a seven foot uh, mass concrete wall along three sides of the shed and on top of that along the two long sides of the shed he had seven foot of Yorkshire boarding and the seven foot of Yorkshire boarding is letting in um, per air space 25% of the air because the boards are put up six inches uh, wide boards and there's two inches between them. The other thing then is uh, Peter has a long canopy right down through the centre of the shed which is 27 metres wide because basically what we want is a 0.04 metre square of an outlet twice that of the inlet the full length of the shed. We have to prevent drafts and the key is calves cannot have drafts because when the calf is less than two weeks old he needs to be kept at 15 degrees every draft that's there is reducing down the actual temperature of the calf and so to keep up the heat in the calf we need to give them a dry bed and no drafts. To reduce the moisture out of the shed, what we need to do is to take the moisture out of the shed. And the moisture is coming from the calves' urine. It's also coming from the automatic feeder because that's going to wash itself three times a day. So what we need to do is to have a slope on the floor at least one in 20. And we need to get that moisture in a gully straight out of the shed into another shed. Right, or into a tank. And what Peter has done here today is um, directly outside both pens, the full length of the shed, he's two gullies which are going into tank directly outside the shed. And the other big feature of Peter's shed here today, it's really, really easy to clean it because with his two 20 foot pens at both sides, he can slide across the door, move the calves from each side into the centre passage and drive in and mechanically clean it out. Also, the walls are very smooth finish to them and the floors, so it's very easy to actually power wash it and get the shed cleanable. Light inside the calf shed is absolutely crucial because if you have light inside the shed, firstly you will see issues. You will see the sick calf, right? You'll see the calf that's not performing. And a quick look inside in a well lit shed, you will really pick up issues very quickly. The other thing Peter has done in the shed here today is created a little micro environment in each pen because he's put down canopies up over each pen that he actually made himself and that he can actually pull them up when he goes in to clean. So it's really given the calves a little micro-environment. And you can see on a cold day, they will actually go in under the micro-environment. Dr. Cardin also outlined some of the modifications that farmers can make to existing buildings. You don't need a new shed to make a shed comfortable for actually the young calves. But the first thing, focus on fresh air. How do you get fresh air into the shed? What Peter has done here today, he's put on both sides the full length of the shed, seven foot mass concrete wall, and over that then, uh, seven foot of Yorkshire boarding we need to give the calf a dry lie. So it's very simple. It's a case of just putting in concrete floor and getting a drainage one in 20 to get the water out of the actual shed. And that can be done quite easily. With drafts, it's very easy thing to do is um, big square bales, big round bales prevent drafts. If you wanted something more permanent, you can get very light stock board six mil and tech screw it onto the gates and underneath it then, uh, put on um, conveyor belting with U-bolts. Both those are very cleanable, they're permanent, and they're there all the time. A lot of the older buildings, it can be quite difficult to actually ventilate them properly to get in the fresh air. There are fans there, they cost about 1,200 each, and they're extremely good. And what's out of the fan is a big long duct that goes the full length of the shed, and it's blown out fresh air all day long. Now, so Doreen, we might just, thanks for joining us this evening. I might just start off with yourself. Um, 
For farmers that maybe don't have a purpose-built calf shed, is there any changes they can make to existing buildings? Uh, absolutely. Um, any building you know I mean, can be modified within reason you know I mean, to rear calves properly. They may not be the lo most labour efficient for the herd owner, but they can definitely be modified for, uh, for the calf. Because what calf needs is something very simple. What they need is a dry, warm lie, fresh air, uh, no drafts, get the moisture out of the house, and then, from the herd owner's point of view, make sure he's plenty of light to see what's going on and that the house can be easily enough cleanable. So the big thing for herd owners is to provide the fresh air, the no drafts, and the dry lie for those calves. And any old house can be modified. Because a dry lie, it's only a case of keeping the straw changed and keep plenty of straw in there. Do you know what I mean? And at this time of the year, you can still, do you know what I mean, put a skim of concrete in the floor, do you know what I mean, to get the drainage. I mean, actually get the moisture out of the house. Because every litre of moisture can take about a calf, three hours of calf heat, do you know what I mean, to get rid of it. So moisture is crucial to actually get out of the house. Um, drafts, very easy to get rid of drafts. Because drafts usually come in straight lines, they don't go around corners. So if it's in through gates, put the uh, stock board in gates, six mils stock board, very light, take screwed onto gates. Put a bit of conveyor belt in onto the end of it so they can move in and out. And then inside in the house, so I mean, square bales, round bales, they'll block drafts. And then have an opening for the calves to go in and lie down. Drafts won't go around corners. Calves can walk around corners. That's perfect. And maybe for farmers, if they want to know is the situation with ventilation in their housing, is there anything they can do to test their ventilation? Yeah, I think the first thing, Michael, as well as testing ventilation, is temperature for calves for the first two weeks of life is crucial. So try and set up a pin for the first two weeks of life that those calves are kept warm. So a max and a min thermometer, you can buy it anywhere, it's very cheap. Do you know what I mean? And for the first fortnight of a calf's life, trying to keep it warm, right? So plenty of straw under it. When it's lying down, you can't see its legs. Do you know what I mean? It's really embedded into straw. And stop taking heat away from it. As it's like yourself, if you go out and sit in a wet stone on a draft with a wet bum, you'll get cold very quickly. Well, if you're sitting on a bed of straw in the shade with a coat on you, you know what I mean? You'll be far more comfortable. So wet bed takes heat, so heat away. Draft takes heat away. Add heat to calves. Good, good, comfortable straw bed. So I mean, and you can farm a nice little micro environment. Peter has a lovely little micro environment up there with his little canopy over them. The other way you can farm it, farm it is line the pin, do you know I mean, with square bales or actually with round bales. Calf jackets are super. Do you know I mean? Just think of a calf as yourself. It needs to be kept warm, fresh air and no draft. Uh, check in ventilation, they can do it with smoke bombs. But one very easy check, uh, Michael, is going to house and if you can smell ammonia, do you know what I mean? It's not well ventilated. And in old houses, we won't have the inlets and outlets correct. Because you can buy those ducts, do you know I mean, that are like a long cylindrical tube that blow out fresh air the whole time. And buy them with a regulator on them. And if they're blowing in fresh air, do you know I mean, that'll make an awful difference to calves. And maybe just for farmers, is there any sort of telltale sign that there is drafts occurring in a shed? Is there any signs of maybe calves in their activities in the sheds? Is there any telltale signs? Oh, about? absolutely, Michael. If you, if you look into a calf pin, and the calves are lying down evenly spread out over the pin. Do you know what I mean? You have no drafts. If you'll see calves lying all the way up along a wall, do you know what I mean? You definitely have a draft. If you see the straw blown in it, you definitely have a draft, right? Or, or go in and actually lie down the pin yourself. Do you know what I mean? It, it absolutely, do you know what I mean? It'll tell you itself, do you know what I mean? Um, whether the drafts are there or not. So maybe. In terms of getting the calf onto the farm for his first day on arrival, is there anything that farmers can do to minimise stress in the environment for these young calves? Oh, absolutely. I think the first thing is, and I think Peter, the last time I was talking to him, he had a good relationship built up with the guys he buys the calves from. So instead of those farmers giving you a look penny with the calves, the best look penny they can actually give you is to make sure the calf has got bee stings. Try and give him an internasal vaccine up the nose. Do you know what I mean? Uh, for a uh, PI3 RSV. 
and if at all, at all possible, if we could get him to de-harden the calf. The best look, Penny, you could actually get him to actually buy the calf. Taking all the work off yourself. <laughs> it's like, what makes you comfortable yourself, Michael, inside in the room? Do you know what I mean? Firstly, make sure you have enough room, do you know what I mean, so the calves aren't crowded. So put them in small groups, do you know what I mean, a seven to nine when they come home. Second thing is, give them a comfortable bed. So I mean, so they have a nice dry bed to lie down. They have access to either hair, straw, access to water, access to creep. And make sure they're well fed. So I mean, because if the calf is comfortable, if he's well fed, if he has enough room, and then if there's no fresh, if there's plenty of fresh air, no drafts, so I mean, you really are providing a good environment for that calf. That's perfect. Peter, I might just bring you into the conversation. We always seen the great facilities you have for your own calves upon arrival and throughout the rearing stage. Is there any maybe lessons you can provide that you've learned over the years when it comes to calf rearing? Yeah, well, I suppose when I started rearing calves, I was rearing them in smaller stables and ventilation was, a, was an issue with me. So transferring into the new shed now with the Yorkshire boarding, um, ventilation, I've noticed a big difference. Um, it's just you can never have enough ventilation. Um, there's no drafts, as Dorian said, with seven foot walls. Um, one of the main things, I suppose, that from in being in the new shed, I think I was between cleaning out calvin pens, I was probably bringing too much moisture into the shed, power washing and hosing down in between bedding, which I've stopped doing now this year, maybe towards the end of last year, just cleaning out and replacing my fresh straw instead of bringing more moisture into the shed. That's one of the main things I've picked up now from last year. Yeah, I, I, think, I think Peter's point there is a crucial one about not alone was Peter from your house above where I saw Peter, you were really good at getting the moisture out of the house because your two bullies outside of each of the um, bays of the calf shed taking it out to a slatted area outside. And also you stopped putting in moisture, do you know what I mean, power washing the place. Do you know what I mean, broken gullies, broken e shoots, do you know what I mean, leaking water troughs. Do you know what I mean, trying to avoid all that moisture, do you know what I mean, inside in the calf house. Right, because what basically moisture does is increases the humidity, and then when you have a lack of fresh air, you have no biocide. And fresh air and low humidity that kills viruses and bacteria very, very quickly. One of the other things I've done during this year was, I suppose, when the first batch of cows comes in, such a big shed, um, a lot of coal with the big concrete walls underneath the canopies. I've put the heat lamps, maybe when there's only ten or fifteen cows in the pen just to try and raise the temperature. And once the temperature goes below a certain degree, I feed an extra 200 grams of milk replacer per day to the calf. So it has more energy and heat. Absolutely. Adding heat is crucial. And you're adding it with a lamp, Peter. So, I mean, you could also add it with calf jackets. And you could also add it putting a whole series of square bales around bales around the pins. So it's a case of adding the heat and definitely do not take it away with drafts and moisture. Great, so we're, we're going to move on to our next segment, section for tonight. Um, before we get into our real discussion about it, we're going to take a quick look at a video where Sean Cummins, one of our advisors on the panel tonight, is going to go through some of the traits that farmers need to be looking out for when sourcing calves this spring. I'm joined now by Sean Cummins, uh, Chagas Green Acres Calf to Beef Program Advisor, Dedicated Program Advisor. Sean, in this video we're just going to look about sourcing the calf. What, do, what factors do we need to consider? Yeah, thanks Niall. So there's a number of factors we need to consider. Over the next couple of weeks it's going to be a busy time for the farmers enrolled in the program and other farmers operating calves to beef systems out there. Um, there's going to be in the region of a million of these little black and white lads available and coloured calves available for beef production over the, the next couple of months coming from dairy farms onto beef farms. There's a number of methods which they can come. So they can come directly from the dairy farm, they can come via marts, they can come via calf buyers. Ideally you want to be known and you want to be buying those calves from April sources. You want to know how that calf has been treated in the first couple of weeks of his life. The dairy beef calf spends very short time of its overall lifetime on the dairy farm. But what happens over those two weeks is very important to its performance. Um, we're basically looking for an animal that has received its colostrum. That's very, very critical. It's the fuel that starts the calf, it starts the immunity. But you're also looking to source calves from herds with a high herd health protocol. So maybe herds that have been vaccinated prior to calving for calf scours. 
that have no history of disease, no like even a common score like crypto, you want to try and avoid those herds if at all possible, so you're not bringing that infection into your farm. We're also looking at the calf's characteristics. We'll be talking in a minute just on what to actually look for in the calf, but you're, you really, you want to ask about the sire details. Um, you want to have, actually have a look at the cow. Does the cow suit your system? Essentially, does, does the animal coming from that cow suit your system? Is it going to be a square animal? Is it going to be, these are beef animals at the end of the day, so they have to be fit for purpose. So you want to see the cows on the farms. You want to make sure that the calf you're buying, it, it actually comes into a saleable product, whether that be at 16 months, 18 months, 20 months, 22 months, or even 28 months down the line. You should really be asking about the, the genetics of the calf. So if you've seen the dam, what bull is that for? You want to be targeting bulls with positive car characteristics for carcass and conformation. They are big, the big, big factors that you have to look at when sourcing calves. So Sean, what are the physical traits we need to be looking out for? Yeah, so Niall, basically the first thing we're going to look at is the calf's eye. We want to make sure it's clear. Is its nose warm? Are its ears upright? And is the calf not showing any signs of sickness when you're looking at? In terms of the skin, the skin should be elastic. It should bounce back once we pinch it. That's a sign that the calf is hydrated. In terms of the physical characteristics, ideally you want the long calf, you have a long line here. Um, you have the confirmation from behind, this is a limousine calf, so essentially this is going to, going to be probably O plus its slot or come two years of age. So that animal is going to be roughly between 600 and 650 kilos at that age. So we need the calf to have good, four good corners to its body. Essentially that means the uprights, the legs that support the calf need to be in place. They need to be there structurally to support that calf down the line. We also need to ensure that the calf is free from scour. Um, this calf is, which is a good sign. And in terms of the navel then as well, the navel needs to be dry. You want to avoid calves with raw flesh and navels, that's the sign the calf is young. You also want to avoid calves that have infections in the navel as well. In terms of the foot as well, we want to ensure that the, the, the actual hoof is worn smooth, that the, the foot of the calf isn't actually bulbous. So Sean, you've, you've went through it in great detail on what farmers need to be looking for in terms of traits of calves when it comes to sourcing them this spring. but. Maybe in terms of factors around calf price, what do farmers need to be considering and what price should they be willing to pay this spring when it comes to buying calves? Yeah, Michael, I suppose over the last couple of weeks we've seen the calf trade take off on a very, very, very firm footing. In reality, you have to question what's the farmer's plans that are buying these calves that are being quoted at mad prices. When you look at dairy calf to beef production systems and you look at the cost of actually bringing an animal to slaughter for 24 months deer system you're generally hovering in around a thousand a thousand euro and fifty to bring that animal to beef at 24 months of age when you include your variable and fixed costs so really farmers need to go back and look at how much it's costing them to produce that animal on farm um if we take for instance our holstein friesian bulls uh Generally on farms we've seen they came in at 65 euro per head last year and 120 and 120 to 150 is the average price for early mature animals. We'd be saying to our farmers generally try and maintain calf price at where it was last year. We're in a period now where beef price is hovering around the 370 cent per kilo mark. It's after coming back down in the last couple of weeks, unfortunately, and we're in a period as well where input prices on farms are starting to increase. So we're seeing that meal prices have increased over the last couple of weeks by 30 to 40 euro per tonne. And in terms of fertilizer, it's all increasing as well. Um, so it, farmers really, really need to sit down and look at the budgets and these systems before they buy the calf. It's worth remembering, even if you take a Holstein Friesian steer system, the cheapest or the smallest outlay in that system you're going to have is the day you buy the calf. If you take, for instance, the cost of rearing that calf is coming in in the region of 124 euro. That's from a calf or even on your farm at three weeks of age, up to 12 weeks of age, to turn out a weaning. When you look then, it's another 99, roughly 100 euro to get that calf back into the shed in November after turning out and another 110 euro for the first winter. So by the time you get that animal to a year old stage, you're after spending in the bones 330 euro. If you pay mad prices for your calves on day one starting off, it's going to be very, very hard to make a system of the, or make a profit out of these systems. There's, there is money to be made, but there's not mad money to be made at some of the prices that we're seeing being quoted for calves at the minute. Um, 
we've seen over the next couple of weeks, we are expecting calf prices to settle and it's starting to come through in the March trade if you look at it very, very closely. Generally, we see around the middle of March, first two weeks in March, generally we see calf supplies really starting to hit the ground and calf price starting to correct. The early calf price, if you go back year in, year out, the early calf price tends to be seasonally high and that's solely down to the availability of calves or the number of calves available on the market. Um, so what I'd really be saying to farmers sit down look at the budget what it's going to cost to bring the animal to slaughter like when we looked at the figures in the region of a thousand euro for a really efficient system finishing 2.5 animals or carrying a stocking rate of 2.5 animals to the hectare as your level of efficiency drops the money you can actually pay for a calf decreases substantially so it's worth going back and actually checking what those animals are worth to you if these calf to beef systems are trading systems it's very simple. It all depends on what you pay for the calf. If you pay too much for the calf and the beef price is poor, you're going to be in trouble starting off. These are a two-year animal at minimum in a lot of cases. A two-year or a, a too expensive an investment starting off is going to put you in a serious challenge position going forward. I suppose this, the key message to take away is for farmers to maybe take hold and consider the, the, the factors um, in terms of money, what they need to be paying and what they're variable costs and their fixed costs are going to be when it comes to sourcing calves. We might just move on. In the video you were speaking about um, positive figures for carcass traits. Can maybe you just explain a bit more on that when it comes to sourcing calves? Yeah, what we'd be saying, uh, Michael, is like there's huge variation in the bulls that are being used on, on dairy crowds across the country. And the majority of calves we're actually dealing with on program farms are Holstein Frisians. So really in terms of the Holstein Frisian, in terms of the sire traits, we'd be looking at a carcass weight of zero. We don't want animals coming in with negative carcass weights if we can at all avoid them. Um, in terms of the early maturing animals, we'd be sort of saying if we can get 10 kilos plus carcass weight, the more genetic potential we have in these animals and if we're able to get, in, to get, get them to reach their targets, um, we have a chance, we have a chance of making money. But if we're working off an animal that has a poor genetic merit coming in, and we've seen instances on some farms where we actually look back on slaughter performance of some of the animals being killed. There was one farmer I'm thinking of where early maturing animals were killed. And we look back at the slaughter data. So these animals were, they were, they were being bought as early maturing animals. They were white-headed heifers, they were Hereford heifers. And when we look back on them, they were actually bred after a stock bull on farm. But when we look at the genetics of the stock bull, the stock bull was was half Hereford over Frisian cow. So essentially this farmer was paying big money for white-headed calves that were three-quarter bred Frisian. Um, so unless we have the genetics right and the correct potential in the animal, no matter what we do on farm level, we're going to be at a potential stumbling block in terms of the ability of that part. Uh, uh, no matter what we do on farm level, we're going to be at a potential stumbling, stumbling block in terms of the ability of that animal to put on carcass weight and actually achieve a profit, profit for the farmers in the program. And Peter, I might just bring you in, into the discussion here. What's your plans when it comes to sourcing calves this spring or what way do you go about it? Yeah, well, I'm after building up a good relationship with um, same few dairy farmers. I go back to the same local farmers every year. I was, the journey for the calves is not more than 15, 20 minutes from farm to farm. Um, I find this really helps with the stress level of the calf. Um, I know the farms that they're coming from. I know the farmer, which is a big help. I know they've got their colostrum. I know the calf is well looked after. Um, another thing I've started doing was I've introduced the first vaccine on the farm so they'll have immunity before they come to my farm, which is another help. Um, that's another thing when you get to know the farmers very well that this you can start introducing this into it. That's basically the main, top, main point of it. I suppose it's great that you have that relationship with the dairy farmer. Is, is it something you've built up over time or is it something that is new? Yeah, on the scene when it comes to sourcing calves and having the availability to apply that vaccine on farm yeah well it's I suppose I've been going back to the same farmers for the last five or six years and it's it's only now we're starting to introduce it so it does take time um, the next thing you want to look at maybe is into the breeding into genetics of the AI so we haven't started doing that yet but hopefully next year now that's something we're going to be looking into Peter that'll be super because if you look at the beef value that's there in the dairy beef index, that takes into account carcass weight, carcass confirmation, and percentage of animals meat in the spec in the factory. So if you could get the highest beef value in those, and then look at the maintenance of the herd owner's cows, do you know what I mean? And trying to get the maintenance of the cows, do you know what I mean? Um, as, as low as you possibly can. 
because we have a cold and we have to sorry, just put that on. Something we're going to look into next year, hopefully. Um, like I said, it hasn't happened yet, but it's it's on the cards, and hopefully we can we can to and fro with the with the sires. Perfect, um, Dorian. I'll just quickly bring you into the discussion as well. The dairy beef index. Are you seeing more dairy farmers using it, or what way? Are you, are you using even beef farmers sourcing cows? Are you, you seeing more of a use as a guide this spring? Um, I, I uh, the dairy beef index is fine, but I think you have to look within it because it's the beef value that's the most important component of it. Because the beef value it takes into account carcass weight, carcass conformation, percentage hit in the spec, and percentage being over fat. So it's very good beef value in it. So what we say to the dairy herd owners is use the highest beef value sires you can get. Use a different crop of them for the maidens, then for the first calvers, then for the second calvers, and then for the mature cows. Because basically you want no calving difficulty, but you need to use different bulls in your mature cows, then on your second calvers, then on your maidens. And in each group, try and select bulls with the highest beef value. Thanks, Doreen. But that brings a conclusion to our discussion tonight. I'd like to thank our panel for participating and I'd also like to thank the, the stakeholders of the Chagas Green Acres Calf Beef Programme. Please join us tomorrow where we'll be going through calf feeding and hygiene on farms. So please join us then. Mm -hmm.